Good morning, everyone, and welcome to ILA. Glad to have everyone here. We're going to go ahead and get started so we can keep on schedule and keep the ball rolling. Uh, I want to take a moment just to thank uh, the city of Coralville and the Marriott for always hosting, uh, being such wonderful hosts and uh, welcoming us and doing such a, a great effort in getting us uh, to this conference and hosting us. So thank you so much. We appreciate that. And you have beautiful weather here. It's gorgeous. Uh, I also want to thank Sliss for a wonderful reception last night. How many of you were there at the reception last night? Fantastic. How many of you are, are alums? Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sliss. It was a wonderful celebration and a wonderful 50 years. Thank you so much. Craig and Amy, are you both here, either one? Our lobbyists? Um, so they are here. Even though they're not in the room. Oh, oh, there, thank you. There's Amy, will you stand? So Amy is one of our lobbyists, and Craig is here, I think, maybe also somewhere. OK, so please feel free to, to stop, stop them. Thank them for all their hard work. If you have questions for them, they are here to answer. So please um, seek them out if you so wish. And I want to quickly recognize um, some of the candidates that we have uh, running for ILA office. They're sitting up here at the head table. Um, Sarah. So please seek these people out. Feel free to introduce yourself, ask them questions. Dan, so take a dr drink of coffee. Lisa, she's scanning the room with her camera. <laughs> and Ryan. And Rebecca. Yay, she's over there. And Sonia. Is she here? So she may be here, I think, but uh, not in the room. So please feel free to seek them out, say hello, introduce yourselves, and ask them lots of questions. They will also be available for you to uh, pester at the ILA booth um, throughout the day. So please see them there. And to keep us rolling right along, I want to introduce Allison, and she's going to uh, also welcome us. great to have everyone back here in Coralville. We love hosting this conference. Um, I'm here to introduce um, our mayor, John Lundell. Um, many of you know him. He's a man about the state. But um, he's been in, I, in the Iowa City Coralville area since 1980 and um, has quite a history of supporting libraries. He was on our library board at Coralville Public Library for 20 years. And um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, an amazing family uh, of, of service givers. Uh, his wife was on city council, and she is a member, a longtime member of our library foundation board. So I mean, their service and, and dedication to the community is immense. Um, in addition to that, John served on the city council for 10 years here and he has now been mayor for four years. Um, he's uh, uh, retired from the University um, Injury Prevention Research Center, so he knows the value of not only the public library in the community, but academic libraries, and um, having two children go through the public schools here, school libraries. So um, he is immersed in libraries, and we are fortunate to have him as our mayor and have him here to welcome us to the conference. John. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Allison, and thank you all for inviting me. Um, if, if you were here and heard me welcome you about four years ago, the last time you, you uh, met here in Corville, you hear this story that I frequently get asked to welcome groups such as yours that choose to meet in our hotel. And um, I always try and think of a common thread of some, some personal story I can make to the group I'm speaking to. And uh, that's pretty easy today <laughs> with all the experience and, and, uh, and uh, just uh, incredible admiration I have for libraries. Um, so I have three things I want to thank you for, but first a really quick anecdotal story about, about reading and, and a personal story. Um, I've all, obviously, I've always been a reader, but it's, I wouldn't say I've been a, a, an avid reader where I've always got my nose in a book. I just didn't have time to do that. I have other hobbies. I love to do woodworking and things like that. So I tried to share, always when I traveled and, and went on vacations, I always read lots of books then. But, um, 
this past Christmas, my, our daughter bought me something I didn't think I would ever really want to use, and that's a Kindle. Uh, I really thought that, you know, I was a little old-fashioned, and I, I like opening that book and putting that bookmark in, inside there. But I tell you, um, it's phenomenal how many books I've read. Because I think not only because I have more time now that I'm retired, but also because that Kindle's always right next to my desk. It's always in my, my case when I, when I travel and so forth. And, um, you know, this summer I... I blew through the adult summer reading program quickly, uh, which I'd never done before. And it's just, it's just kind of funny that, that I never thought I would be a, a Kindle guy, and, and I, I like it. Now, it doesn't mean I don't check out books from the library, too. Once in a while, I, I run slow on a book, and the Kindle runs out, so I go get check out and finish the book in hard copy or something like that. So, But anyway, um, three things I want to thank you for. Of course, I want to thank you for choosing Coralville and our Marriott Hotel for your meeting this year. Um, I know this is the fourth time that you've been here, and, and uh, we are really blessed to have you come here. Groups like yours are the bread and butter for our hotel. In case you don't know, the city of Corville owns this hotel. When I was first I ran for my first elected office for city council in 2003, the only issue on the really on the ballot, or that my content, my opponent had on his ballot, uh, was to stop the city from building this hotel and conference center. And um, we saw it as as a way to stimulate growth in the Iowa River Landing District that we have here and obviously I think that's that's been successful and we're very proud of that but this this is a group hotel that well will always welcome the occasional business traveler or the person coming off the interstate it's groups like yours that, that make this place go so we really appreciate that we hope you come back uh, when you do come back um, very good chance uh, that this will look completely different we're getting ready to in the next year to initiate a complete renovation starting with this meeting space the the carpets the they're they're you might think they're beautiful. A lot of brides don't think they go with her, their gowns very well and things like that. <laughs> so, you know, it's a neutral palette these days that are in, that's in vogue. So when you come back next time, there'll be new floor coverings and wall coverings in here, and it'll just have a little more modern look. So hope, hope you get to see that. Second thing I want to thank you for, also related to the hotel, is putting up with the with a little bit of construction in the lobby. That was a whoops that happened about two weeks ago where um, the, there was a mechanical contractor in the hotel looking uh, to um, service our, our um, heating and air conditioning system, which is a wet system, a piped system. And there's a, a, a maintenance room above the lobby that serves the air conditioning and heating it, that serves the lobby below. And they decided that the system needed to have a recharge and, and a replacement of the glycol that's in the system. and they. They uh, started draining it into a floor drain and went off and had coffee, not realizing the floor drain was much smaller in diameter than the, than the supply pipe that was putting the water in there. And, and before we knew it, we had a flood of antifreeze basically raining down in the lobby of the hotel. And it was a, it was a big whoops. The insurance company's taking care of it. But I'm sorry for the inconvenience of having to walk through that. It's not a very good first impression, but you should have been here when it was dripping the, the antifreeze. <laughs> So, and lastly, I want to just thank you um, for everything that you do as librarians. Um, you know, these days at the state level and at the federal level, we seem to be challenged to be able to have freedom of choice on many issues. Uh, we're being told um, how to live our lives. And libraries are just such an important part of the community that defies that, that we, are, we do have freedoms to make our choices. We have freedom to, to read the books that we choose to read. Um, you do. You offer so much programming in your facilities that go far beyond reading. Uh, Coralville just uh, hosted uh, three weeks ago tomorrow, uh, hosted their second community meal this this summer. Outdoor community meal uh, had hundreds of people. It was a free meal for all walks, all everyone in the community, and you saw everyone from the with the most resources to the fewest resources taking advantage of a community meal, enjoying music out on the yard. And it's just one example of the many great programming that goes on in our, in our library, and I'm sure in yours as well. Um, three weeks ago, I had the opportunity and, and the honor to be elected president of the Iowa League of Cities. So in the coming year, I'll be uh, representing the 970-some cities and towns uh, across the state. And believe me, um, I will be a huge proponent for the most important city department, and that's library. Um, I, I'm a big believer in partnerships. Oh, thank you. And I, I don't want this to sound like a political speech because it's, it's not. I, it's just the way I feel. Um, but um, I am a strong proponent of partnerships. And I think that uh, times, gonna, times are tough. 
Um, and I think one of the ways to overcome these tough times is through partnerships. And I think that um, there are definitely some connections between ILA and ILC, League of Cities and, and Iowa Library Association. So I look forward to working with Rebecca, R Rebecca and, um, and the rest of you in the, in the upcoming year on issues that are important to both of us. Okay, I've taken my time. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we are going to go to the foundation, and uh, Sarah will be up here to um, perhaps um, introduce some scholarship winners. Good morning, everyone. Um, as president of the Iowa Library Association Foundation Board, this is my favorite thing that I get to do every year. Um, we uh, present two scholarships, one to a student from UNI and one to a student from the University of Iowa to help them further their library careers. This morning, um, it is my honor to present the ILAF scholarship to Christina Moore. Christina Moore is the winner of the ILAF scholarship and has been enrolled at the University of Northern Iowa since the fall of 2016. And she currently has two career goals. She wants to expand the resources that are offered to the ever-growing English language learner population and to develop library maker spaces where students can be creators and not just consumers of technology. She has already put, in, put her second goal into action and created a maker space in the Clarion Goldfield Dow's High School Library where she is a teacher librarian. And just talking to her this morning about some of the things she's got going on, it sounds like a really fun place and almost makes me wish I was back in high school. So, <laughs> <laughs> congratulations, Christina. Um, Benjamin Schmidt, the winner of this year's Tilson Scholarship, was not able to be with us this morning. Benjamin's time in library school has sparked an interest in data analytics and its application in emerging digital technologies and learning environments. Since December of 2015, he has worked in the Special Collections at the University of Iowa and is currently responsible for developing a data set of the department's internal records. Last week, Benjamin presented a paper at the Massive Open Online Courses Conference in Texas that explored the connection between peer feedback and retention rates. Moving forward, Benjamin hopes to connect with applications beyond the library world and explore technologies that will continue to shape the information future. And now, we're all ready for the foundation and their song and dance routine. Come on up. <laughs> My God, they're annoying. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you to the final round of the ILAF cheering competition. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, this is a fantastic statewide competition and has now come down to the two final teams for the 2017 state title. You will help determine the winner by your applause as measured by the applause-o-meter. This is a patent-pending trademark device. <laughs> oh. Forgot to turn this off. <laughs> no. Mom, no, I've already bought you 700 raffle tickets. No, no more, no more. I, yeah, okay, it's tough to hitchhike with the walker. I get it. All right. All right, no more tickets. She wants the cat. <laughs> now, let me introduce you to our teams. 
On my right, cheering for the ILAF raffle, we have the ticket takers. <laughs> On my left, we have, um, yeah, gosh, oh, the high bidders, that's it, for the auction, right, right. Now in the final rapid cheering round, each team will give two cheers. Then we will rate them by your applause. Let's start with the ticket takers. Ready, set, buy a ticket, send a buck, buy a ticket, try your luck, buy a ticket, don't get mad, buy a ticket, win a tab, buy a ticket, win a tab, buy a ticket, it's all that. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was special. <laughs> and now, the high bidders. Now that was talent. <laughs> now back to the ticket takers for their final cheer. Well, they're looking a little surly. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think we got it. <laughs> now, back to the high bidders. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You can't top that. Now, members of the audience, this is your opportunity to help select the 2017 ILAF Cheer Squad of the Year. Let's hear it for the ticket takers. It's pretty much off the chart there. <laughs> And how about the um, raffle people there? No, we, did, we just did, oh yeah, that, that was you, yeah, yeah. Now, the auction people. Boy, that was tough, I don't know. I think I'm gonna have to declare it a tie. So this is, what you really have is a bunch of people that have really committed to the auction for the Iowa Library Association Foundation. Please skim past the auction tables, bid frequently, bid often. And also, buy some raffle tickets. iPad Pro, beautiful handmade cat. It sounds better when you see, it looks better when you see it when I talk about a handmade cat, but it is gorgeous. So. <laughs> Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you. Okay, we are ready to get this conference underway, and we're going to start off with our first keynote. And I have to say, I, I've known that I was going to introduce Corey for a while, and of course, last night as I was drifting off to sleep, I thought, oh, I don't have anything written. <laughs> so I woke up at 4.30 this morning thinking, oh, I've got something fantastic to write. 
So I wrote it out and I looked at it and I realized, I'm not sure if I'm using this word correctly. <laughs> so I had to Google it and pick up the Miriam dictionary and see if I was using that phrase correctly. And I thought, well, I think so. So I continued on. And then I found myself again, <gasps> I'm not sure I'm using that word correctly. And so I rewrote it and revised it a couple times and decided, you know, this was just too much pressure. So I've decided I'm going to keep this short and sweet and introduce a woman who is a fantastic author of a brand new book called Word by Word, or Word by Word, yeah. And she is a lexicographer at Merriam-Webster. And she has actually driven through Iowa. Multiple times. She is hoping for her pie shake during this visit. And without any further ado, please give a warm Iowa welcome to Corey Stamper. Hey, Iowa librarians. Let me pull up my... Oop, oop, oop. Oh, technology. Here we go. There we are. Now we're here. I am so glad to be here. I'm actually very honored to be opening your conference, um, in part because librarians are my people. You are my people. We both really love books. And that's part of why we went into our respective professions, right? You were probably a kid like me. You lost yourself in books. You hid in libraries. I had a whistle chair that I would drag underneath of the circulation desk, and I would camp out there. And this is why, this is why we went into our professions. But you also, like me, discovered upon entering your profession, that it's really only about like 20% of this beautiful, quiet, idyllic moment with books, and then it's like 80% of this, right? <laughs> because you don't just deal with books as a librarian, and as a lexicographer, you don't deal with books either. You deal with people, and people are messy and are weird, and you know, as any of you who have ever had to work the reference or circulation desks at your library know, people come to you with questions that are impossible to answer. But sometimes those people are the things that actually make you love and respect your job more and actually lead you into a deeper understanding of your calling. So I want to talk about today, I'm going to share a story of basically how forced human interaction on my part led me into a deeper appreciation of the English language. And this will actually touch on inclusivity, I promise, somehow. So one of the duties of a Merriam-Webster editor is not just to write dictionary definitions, but to answer people's questions. They often look like this one. And within my first month of work, I was put on answering email. So I was asked to answer an email that was not so much a question as it was a massive complaint. And that was that the correspondent had found out that we entered irregardless into our dictionary. And he was outraged. And because decency and standards and demise of English and morals and I am boycotting you forever and so on and so on. Now, when I got this email, as many of you who have worked circulation or reference know, you try not to have any kind of expression on your face as they're telling you this. But I, because I was buying a computer, I rolled my eyes. Because I had been at work for a couple of weeks. I knew what the dictionary was. And obviously, we don't enter irregardless, because it's not a word, right? We all know that, irregardless is not a word. So I thought this guy was just using any old Webster's online dictionary. There's like 20 million of them. And he found irregardless entered into some terrible one. And he thought it was ours. And you know, it's understandable, I thought. So I'll be gentle. So I started drafting a reply and said, hey, so this clearly is not a word. And so we wouldn't enter it into a dictionary. If you actually went to our online dictionary and looked up irregardless, you would see this message. But I had only been at work for a couple of weeks, and I said, OK, I need to find the little URL that is the, this word's not entered into the dictionary URL. So I opened up the online dictionary. I typed in it regardless, 
and I lost it because irregardless is entered in our dictionary. <laughs> I was so surprised and horrified and embarrassed for us. How dare we make such a stupid mistake that even though I work in an office so quiet that it rivals your stacks, I loudly vocalized my dismay. So how did we get here? How did this stupid non-word get entered into America's oldest dictionary? Well, we need to start by taking a step back and thinking about what dictionaries do. Now, when most of us think about dictionaries, we think of them kind of like we think of librarians, right? They're authorities and they know everything. The dictionary is the thing that tells you what the English language is. So if a word is in the dictionary, we think, it's because it's part of the English language, the real English language. The dictionary becomes a guardian of English because we all know English is completely out of control. <laughs> if we don't have someone setting the rules, then English is just, I mean, it's just a giant tire fire. Everything's gonna devolve into grunts and gestures and emoji. Now, this approach to language is actually this idea we have about dictionaries typifies something that is called prescriptivism. This is an approach to language that basically says we champion the best practices of English. Now you'll see I've put prescriptivism on a spectrum, so that means there's something at the other end. And at the other end is this approach called descriptivism. Now if prescriptivism believes that we champion the best practices of English and we jettison everything else, then descriptivism means that all languages are created equal and that it's not so much an issue of right and wrong or good or bad, but just context. Now, most people who love books and love language look at this spectrum and they are solidly on the prescriptivism end of it, right? Because as we have explained, English is on fire and we need boundaries. So I regret to inform you that actually dictionaries are on the descriptive end of the spectrum. Now, I was, I would say, moderately shocked and considered a career change about three weeks into my job when I discovered this was the case. The job of a lexicographer, as Noah Webster himself put it, is to collect, define, and arrange as far as possible all the words in a language. So the dictionary, instead of being the guardian of English, is just an observer. We just describe as accurately as possible all the words in a language. So I went to my boss and I said, this is ridiculous. We can't enter all the words. And he said, well, we have, as you will learn, some rules. I thought, oh, phew. So there are three criteria for entry into a dictionary. The first is that a word has to have widespread written use. And by widespread, I don't just mean geographically. I don't mean San Francisco and Cedar Rapids and Gainesville. I mean, it also needs to have tonal widespread use. So an ideal dictionary candidate would be a word that's used in like the Wall Street Journal and in Vibe magazine. If it's only used in something like gourmet or bon appetit, Eh, okay, so it's a food term, but it's not quite widespread. The second criterion is it needs to have sustained use in print. So dictionaries actually don't capture all the words in a language. There's a lot more language than there are lexicographers. And so what we try and do is we aim for a really good cross-section of the language. So if you're just taking a cross-section, then words that only appear once or twice in print 50 years ago, or you know, my, maybe they appear a lot in 2015 and never again, that's probably not gonna be in your cross-section. Sustained use means that you're gonna get it in that cross-section. And finally, a word needs to have meaningful use. I don't mean it needs to have significant use in the canon or anything like that. It means it needs to have a meaning that I can deduce from context. And that struck me as utterly ridiculous because words have meaning. Except not all words, it turns out, have the kind of meaning that a lexicographer can grab onto. So most of you are familiar with the word 
anti-disestablishmentarianism. It is used as an example of a long word, often as the longest word entered into the dictionary. Regret to inform you it's not entered into the dictionary because it doesn't have a meaning. It doesn't mean a long word, right? Like nobody says he put a lot of anti-disestablishmentarianisms in his OkCupid okay profile to date librarians. Nobody says that. They might just say, here's a list of long words and anti-disestablishmentarianism is on it. So it doesn't actually have a meaning, a contextual meaning. So these are our three criteria for entry. Widespread, sustained, and meaningful use. That means that any word that meets all three criteria is eligible to be entered and defined in a dictionary. So that's great, but what about all the wrong words, right? What about irregardless? Who cares if it has widespread, sustained, and meaningful use? By dummies, obviously. <laughs> Let's unpack a little bit more. So what do we mean when we say wrong words? Now, you have all survived the American educational system, which means that you have unwittingly imbibed this idea that language itself has a moral charge, that words are good and bad. Now, prescriptivism and descriptivism play a part in this. The logic kind of goes like this. Prescriptivism champions the best practices of English, right? So if best practices are what we're after, best means good, and good means correct, and correct means right, in all the sort of heavy connotative uses of the word right. So prescriptivism is good. And if prescriptivism is good, then obviously the thing on the other end, descriptivism, is bad. Why would it be bad? Because it adulterates language. It presents no standard. It throws all the rules out the window. How are you gonna know if something is right or wrong if you don't have somebody telling you what's right or wrong? Now, uh, E.B. White, who is the author of Charlotte's Web and also the other half of Strunk and White who wrote the best-selling writing guide, The Elements of Style, he sort of sums up the modern view of descriptivism in a letter to his publisher. He wrote, I've been sympathetic all along with your qualms about the elements of style, but I know that I cannot and will shall not attempt to adjust the unadjustable Mr. Strunk to the modern liberal of the English department, the anything goes fellow. Your letter expresses contempt for this fellow, but on the other hand, you seem to want his vote. I'm against him, temperamentally, and because I've seen the work of his disciples, and I say, the hell with them. <laughs> right, and someone clapped, because we cheer. Yeah, the hell with them. <laughs> to hell with those anything goes, commie, liberal, hippie, pinko, descriptivist yahoos. Yeah, so dictionaries, a reminder, are the commie, pinko, liberal, descriptivist yahoos. We don't just enter right, good, pure language. We enter bad and ugly stuff too. Because you would be shocked at how much bad and ugly stuff gets into print on a consistent basis. So back to irregardless. The spectrum of hatred against irregardless <laughs> is unmatched. Everybody says they hate moist, right? But it's kind of a jokey hate. We all go, ooh, gross, moist, bleh. But if you ask someone about irregardless, their hatred is specific and vehement, and they begin listing all the reasons why irregardless is terrible. It's not a word. It's nonsense. It's a double negative, so anyone with education, sense, or judgment is never going to use it. It's redundant. We already have regardless. It's illogical. It's not a word. It's a hallmark of uneducated speech, and so it should not be entered into a dictionary because dictionaries will then sanction its use. All of these complaints point in one general direction, and that is that irregardless is evidence that English is going to hell, and you, Merriam-Webster, are skipping down the easy path, swinging the handbasket. 
Now, part of my own shock at finding that Irregardless was entered into the dictionary that I now was responsible for was because I knew, sort of at a molecular level, that it was wrong. It was just wrong. But in this particular case, when this email came in, my job was to defend an entry that I felt was doo-doo. So, I wrote, yes, I too am surprised and shocked to find that it's entered, but please note that we label it as non-standard, which is a very fancy way of saying that it's not accepted by most educated speakers of English, and we have this very long usage paragraph after the one word definition that ends with use regardless instead. That's as prescriptive as us commie liberal pinkos will get. And I finished this email by saying something I actually did not believe at the time. We are duty bound to record the language as it is used. I sent it off and I hoped this would just be an isolated incident, but actually this is a very common complaint to dictionary companies. So I got really good at defending a word that I absolutely hated with every fiber of my being. People would write in and I would respond and say, Yes, irregardless is in fact a word, and not only is it a word, but it is one with a surprising amount of written use. Yes, irregardless is redundant, but if we're gonna start cutting words out of the language because we're, they're redundant, we're gonna set fire to half of the English language because redundancy is a feature in our language, not just a bug. You are correct that irregardless is an illogical coinage, but so is unthaw to mean thaw and inflammable to mean flammable, but no one is going to burn down grocery stores because their chicken says unthaw in the refrigerator on it. And of course we understand that irregardless is generally considered a hallmark of uneducated speech. That's why we've got that really long usage paragraph that is really, really prescriptive at the end. Thank you for taking the time to write. <laughs> I had come to an uneasy accord with irregardless. Yeah, I had looked at the evidence and it merited entry, fine, but it was still, I felt in my heart, stupid and ugly and love, unlovely and just totally wrong. So one of the great things, as I said, about being forced into human interaction, which is something I did not sign up for when I became a lexicographer, is that you are constantly surprised through other people's Englishes at the flexibility and the beauty of the English language. So in 2003, five years in, I was the managing editor for all of the editorial correspondence. I got to see every email that came in. And I got a different kind of complaint about irregardless. To whom it may concern, as any educated Mississippian knows, irregardless is the superlative form of regardless, not used in lieu of, as is stated by y'all. <laughs> now, I was not about to answer this email. Because if I answered this email, that would mean I would have to investigate this person's claims. And if five years of lexicography at that point had taught me anything, it was that going through the written evidence for a word might lead me to being unswervingly wrong about a word that I still deeply felt was totally bogus. So in other words, even though I knew that this is not how English worked at all, in my heart, I wanted irregardless to stay wrong so that I could be smart and morally right. But I was also not gonna foist this off onto any of the editors underneath of me. So I got out of my chair and I began looking at the accumulated evidence we have in writing for the word irregardless. And almost immediately I found this by Alice Walker. I remembered the magnitude of his problems, problems I was just beginning to truly understand, as a black man and as an artist, growing up poor, forced to endure the racist terrorism of the American South. He was unlucky in love and no prince of a parent, irregardless, as the old people said, and as Mr. Sweet himself liked to say. Not only had he lived to a ripe old age, 
but he had continued to share all his troubles and his insights with anyone who would listen, taking special care to craft them for the necessary effect. Now, we'll do a little lexicography here. It's early in the morning, but I believe you can handle it. There's something very weird about this particular irregardless. The primary way that you know that is because of the emphasis that it's given in the text. It almost seems like it's kind of this long wave of the hand, right? Sort of something that's gonna just forestall further discussion on Mr. Sweet's unluckiness in love and his no prince of apparentness. And the thing is, is that if you look at the rest of the written record, which contains a lot of irregardless actually, you just don't see that kind of emphasis. Irregardless will show up in print, and it's just unremarkable apart from the fact that someone's using the word irregardless. So there's something about this irregardless that's different. My suspicions were confirmed when I looked at the, the notes that we keep on each of these things. Two years prior, our most senior editor, the man whose title is Director of Defining, which is the coolest title in the universe, <laughs> He had done a revision on Irregardless, and when you do a revision on an entry, you go through all the accumulated evidence, and you either stamp it as used, which means it's covered by the entry, or you stamp it as rejected, which means it's not covered by the current meaning. And this was stamped as rejected. That meant that this use of Irregardless is not just sort of a flat synonym use of regardless, it's different. So, is my correspondent right? about this horrible word. So I went spelunking. The written evidence for irregardless goes back to the late 1700s. And the remarkable thing about its very earliest uses in print is that they are totally unremarkable. There's no commentary on someone using irregardless on its fitness as a word or not. But by the early 1800s, just about 10 or 15 years after it first shows up in print, suddenly, irregardless is verba non grata. It is the evidence of an undernourished mind. So here's an example from the early 1800s from the Logansport, Indiana Reporter. Basically, this is an op-ed piece, very snarky op-ed piece that is looking at a teacher's report from Jefferson Township. This is a very tiny township. And in the report, the teacher says, keep the scholars in regular years work irregardless of their desire is my best judgment. The uh, snarky op-ed reporter goes on to say, the trustee suggests that it would probably be inuseless to suggest anything for these unrestless scholars who are so irregardless of their conduct. So clearly, this is only you know, 20 years after the word first shows up in print. And by this point, it's clear that irregardless is evidence of someone being an idiot. So, so what changed in 20 years? Well, the hint is in where irregardless came from. Irregardless started life as a dialect word. So dialects are kind of little subsets of a language. We tend to think of dialects as being regional, right? There's Southern English, there's whatever they do in Boston, there's New York English, there's Valley Girl. But actually, you can divide up, and you should divide up dialects sort of all different ways. You can divide up dialects by ethnicity, you can divide them up by age, socioeconomic bracket, even occupation. So irregardless was a dialect term common among rural English speakers in the upper Midwest. That's where it began. But society was undergoing this big shift. American society began urbanizing, which meant that our language preferences also began urbanizing. And by the time that this Logansport reporter shows up, we know that our language preferences have moved to the language of the city. The language of city speakers was considered educated and elegant, which by default, because we like to think in binaries, means that the language of rural and small town speakers was backwards and hickish. This didn't just happen to irregardless, this happened to the entire English language. In the 1700s in England, this giant social shift took place. Previously, you had aristocrats and you had everybody else. 
And in the 1700s, these landed aristocrats began losing money and influence. And they were losing it to the sort of the lower class merchants. And they began gaining money and therefore influence. That meant if you were an aristocrat in the 1700s in England, that you were now dealing with people who 50 years ago didn't even merit a hello. But now those people maybe sat at your table or they owned your house and rented it back to you. So because we like to be better than all of the other people around us, the aristocrats did something that they held on to the only thing they could. They held on to this idea of refined manners, which was typified by elegant and educated speech. This is how they defended themselves against what turned out to be the rising middle class. English was no longer how we just communicated. Now it was a defending fortress. This is the point at which prescriptivism starts up. And this is also the originating point of the idea of proper English. Prior to this, English was English. Maybe you spoke a different dialect, maybe I couldn't understand that, but it wasn't wrong. The idea of standard English is that there is this one type of English that we all use. But the reality is, is that that flattens language into something that it absolutely is not. And then it becomes a dividing line between someone who's educated and uneducated, or good and bad. The problem with this view of standard English being the one thing we have is that without dialects, there's no such thing as language. Standard English, this thing we hold up as being normal, is actually a written thing. It's a written standard, which means that no one natively grows up speaking standard English. Everyone grows up speaking a dialect. Most of you speak multiple dialects. This is why you had to go through Mrs. Carlson's seventh grade class on how to use who and whom. This is why we you know, force kids to think about what's the difference between an adverb and a preposition. Here's the other thing about standard English. Standards are fixed, right? But standard English is a moving target. It changes depending on the tastes of the age. So, 150 years ago, Standard English did not allow for this sentence. This is called the progressive passive, the house is being built. This was not allowed. This was seen as hickish and stupid. So what did you say instead of the house is being built? Well, you used the passival, the house is building. <laughs> this was the preferred use 150 years ago. Now this looks ridiculous to us. If someone said the house is building, we'd go, mm -hmm. I don't think so. <laughs> That's because it's non-standard to us. This isn't part of standard English now, but 150 years ago, it absolutely was. So you'll remember I went spelunking to find evidence of irregardless as this intensive form of regardless, and the more I looked, the more I found. And the more I looked at what I found, the more I realized that our current understanding of irregardless is wrong. You see, in the dialects where irregardless is standard or used, it's not used to mean regardless. It's used as an official sounding pivot point away from a discussion or a topic. That earlier bit from Alice Walker's book that we looked at, it's a perfect example of it in writing, right? It's the wave of the hand, it's a deflection, it's a way of saying, we're done here. But that's the kicker, because lexicographers only look at written English, and that particular use doesn't translate well into print. It's really hard in print, and especially in things like newspaper articles, to nail inflection or tone or register. So when irregardless shows up in print, we lose that nuance. So you couple that with the fact that almost as soon as irregardless is spread outside of its native speaking communities, 
it's castigated as wrong, that means that people who natively use irregardless are suddenly self-policing themselves and they are no longer using irregardless because they don't want to be seen as stupid. The problem with imbuing language with morality is that by extension we extend that to the speakers of a language. This is a self-defense mechanism, right? We build up a fortress of right and wrong. This is the thing that defends us from the ravening hordes of uneducated people, so on and so forth. You want to be the smartest person in the room, so you fortify that tower as well as you can. The problem is, is that this also makes it very easy to judge other speakers. So let's say that you have a patron come in, and they say to you, I need to ask you about a book. Yeah, so what's the first thing you do? Well, you first you're hung up on ax for ask because that's non-standard. And then maybe unthinkingly, you start making assumptions about that person and what they've asked you for based on their use of ax, right? So maybe you recommend that they not read Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury because that's really, I mean, it's really difficult language. It's really difficult. Trust me, you just, you don't want to read Faulkner. We tend to think of inclusivity, when we think of it, within sort of spaces or programs, right? How do we make this space accessible? How do we model our programs for ELL learners? How do you even get teens to know where the library is, let alone come into the library? Are the books and the services that we offer representative of different types of people? Are we looking beyond ourselves? And that's a good thing. You have to be prodded to think outside of your own experiences, right? That's part of what a library does. But inclusivity also is an internal thing. It begins at home. You see, the strength of descriptivism, the hippie, commie, pinko, liberal view of language, is that it's inherently inclusive. All varieties of language are on equal footing. It's not about right or wrong or good or bad. It's about context. That means that the guy who comes in and acts about a book can ax about a book. And that's fine. It means nothing about what his education level is or his intelligence is. It also means descriptivism is no longer centered in you and your own experience. It doesn't rely on what your ideas of good English are. So once you stop thinking of language as this sort of moral battlefield against which we defend ourselves from the ravening hordes or from entropy, you can start appreciating the complexity of English. The intensive irregardless, linguistically, is actually incredibly complicated and nuanced. The more that I studied the intensive irregardless, the more I came to admire it. So you can tell me I'm a terrible person in the breakout session later, don't worry. Seriously though, think about this. Here's a word that begins life in speech as this very nuanced deflector. It's completely flattened in print. And given sort of this tone and this meaning, it doesn't quite have. It's immediately set up as the ultimate straw man in the demise of English argument. And it just keeps going. It's a word that everybody hates with the fire of a thousand suns but it is still consistently and constantly in printed, edited prose, and has been for over 200 years. It is a word that people claim is only used by uneducated doofuses. One of my favorite citations for the word irregardless comes from the oral arguments of a Supreme Court case. And lawyers typically are pretty educated people. Irregardless, hasn't just sort of hung on like this barnacle that we need to scrape from the hull of English. It's actually one of the words that proves how resilient and how flexible and therefore how beautiful English is. So, the woman who is giving your opening keynote is America's foremost irregardless apologist now. <laughs> I did a video for Merriam-Webster a few years ago about irregardless. 
countering the idea that it's not a word. And as soon as the video was released, the hate mail began. <laughs> they put this broad in charge of the English language? We're doomed, doom! But all of this abuse underscored that people don't understand how dictionaries work, but even more, they don't understand how language works. This is how language works. Uh, my favorite complaint was one that was very, it was pretty calm for, you know, the vehement hatred against you regardless. But they went ahead and said, look, you need to take it out of the dictionary because it's a made up word that made it into the dictionary through constant use. <laughs> and I cackled aloud. I said, yes, that's exactly right. That's how this language racket works. Things get into the dictionary through constant use. And even further, all words are made up. We don't like mine for them in whales or something. We don't find them on the ocean floor. They're all made up. Lots of people think of English as this fortress that defends us against barbarians and which we need to defend against the forces of entropy and chaos. But it's actually a lot more accurate to think of English as a river. So when you look at rivers, you just see this one cohesive ribbon of water, right? But if you talk to someone who studies rivers, they'll tell you that all rivers are made up of hundreds of different currents. And each of those currents does its own thing. Some currents move fast, some move slow, some are actually flowing in the opposite direction to the way that the river is going. But together, all of those currents make this river different from every other river in the world. You remove one of those currents and you change the river entirely. Its flow, its ecosystem, its path, everything. In English, all of those currents are dialects. Here's the other thing about rivers. You can try to block them, you can try to set a new bed for them, you can try to redirect them, and unless you maintain that vigilance, it doesn't work. You can say irregardless is not a word, you can say that this dialect or that dialect or the guy that says ax, that has a deleterious effect on English, shouldn't be encouraged. But English, just like a river, ultimately will go wherever it damn well pleases. You can't kill irregardless. And even if you could, you probably shouldn't. Okay, so should you start using irregardless? Well, no. If it's not already in your dialect, you shouldn't. Should you think less of people who do use irregardless? Absolutely not. When they use irregardless, they are actually extending inclusivity to you. They're giving you a peek into their linguistic identity. They're demonstrating how inclusive the English language itself is. Because for its 150 year history, English has been nothing if not inclusive. It started life as an import from Saxon invaders. It got overrun by the Vikings and then later the French. And instead of rolling over, it just kept going. It picked up a whole bunch of spare parts from Spanish and Dutch and Arabic and Italian during the age of exploration. We let Isaac Newton and Galileo fart around with it quite a bit. It was stretched and remolded and reshaped during the Industrial Revolution. It was also shaped by waves of immigrants that took it up as an adopted tongue. And no matter what usage commentators and your own sense of English tells you, it has managed to survive in spite of globalization, daytime television, <laughs> teenagers, and the internet. <laughs> so be inclusive about language. Don't stifle it, but embrace it. Good, bad, ugly, and irregardless. Thank you. I feel like you know my deepest, darkest language secrets. <laughs> I have grown children who I still correct, and I, uh, they hate me for it. Uh, thank you. And if any of you are audiobook 
uh, users, readers. Um, she does a fantastic audiobook. It's wonderful. Uh, thank you all. A couple announcements. Uh, first off, Prairie Lights will be here selling Corey's book. Um, they will be in the exhibit hall and should be here shortly. And you're going to be signing mm -hmm. at some point. I think at 125. At 125 or sometime this afternoon. Okay, 125, so she'll be signing in the exhibit hall. So please feel free to uh, take advantage of that. A couple other things uh, before we go on to uh, the rest of the conference. Um, please uh, make note that the uh, candidates for executive board, the folks up here, will be at the ILA booth uh, throughout the conference. So please stop in at the ILA booth, meet, greet, ask questions, harass them, whatever you want to do. Um, Friday morning. We have a first ever breakfast with the board. Bright and early tomorrow morning, 7.30. Come meet with us, ask us questions, throw out ideas. It's your opportunity to kind of bend our ear and uh, have your way, so to speak. <laughs> uh, let's see. Sense two. That's right, sense two. Um, an important note, there is a session that has been canceled. So this is, the title of the session is called Technology for the 21st, or 21st Century Parent. It's this afternoon at 3.35. We do not have a speaker. She was unable to come. Uh, so that session has been canceled. Again, that session title, Technology for the 21st Century Parent. So that will not be available today. Uh, one last note, uh, there are thank you cards out by the ILA registration desk all the way wherever it is, about a mile away. Um, there are thank you notes there for your legislators. So please feel free to pick those up, drop them off, thank them for all their support. You can do them for your state legislators, your local, whatever you want. Make sure that they know that we appreciate their support and their funding. Any last announcements? All right, go and enjoy. Thank you.